Hey, this is Dan from Bible Prophecy and Truth, and this is part 19 of the series on understanding the book of Revelation and the timeline of events. And we're going to talk about chapter 19 today. And I'm going to jump right in. Verse 1, and after, I, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her, with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. I remember in chapter 16, we saw at the end of the, the wrath of God that the great earthquake went and destroyed the great whore. The great Babylon came in remembrance. And then in 17 and 18, we studied who that great whore was or is, and the uh, uh, the mystery Babylon. And again, so it's talking about it here. This this is the, the same thing that we saw in Revelation 7, uh, starting in verse 9, when we had the, the people that had come out of great tribulation. And this is the, the same statements that it's making here, where it says in verse 3, And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And this is the same, the, the same thing that we see, as I said, in Revelation 7. We see again in Revelation 21. There's uh, a couple different places that we have this group that we see, which is that same last day event. It's the same timing that we see at the end of the vials is when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives and that great earthquake happens and it goes all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, destroys Rome. And that's this event that we're seeing here. And then verse 6, And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper, supper of the Lamb, or I'm sorry, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And you see, this is an angel showing John these things, and he fell down to worship it, and he's like, no, don't do that, because he's just an angel, he's not God. But you can see here that this, that the, the marriage supper of the Lamb is prepared, and that there's a, there's a great multitude which is the same thing we saw in Revelation 7. We saw, we see in Revelation 21, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that some more when we get to Revelation 21, but the, the thing I want to point out here is that it's the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride of Christ. And the, the bride is given, uh, she's arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And we saw... In Revelation 7, as well, we saw that the great multitude that came out of great tribulation was clothed in white robes. And uh, also in the fifth seal, the souls under the altar that were told to rest yet a little while, they were given white robes at that time. And then there's, there's more to be said about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Most people are like, well, what in the world is that? And the first time I saw that, it's like, what does that mean? And when we look at Revelation 21, I'm going to I'm going to talk about it more when we when we study Revelation 21. But uh, just right up front, the bride is depicted as a building. In Revelation 21, it has the twelve apostles as the foundations, and the twelve tribes of Israel are the gates of this city. 
and it's not it's not really a city it's not a, a an actual building or a city it's a symbolic representation of the people of God it's the with the 12 apostles as the foundation and the 12 tribes as the as the gates of the city it's it's a picture of the people of God the saints of God all clothed in in white robes and uh, which are the bride of Christ. We, if we love Jesus, we are his bride. And that's what it's referring to here. So I, I'll talk about that more when we get to, uh, to Revelation 21. Uh, but it's basically the same thing, that, that she's arrayed in fine linen. She's the bride of Christ, which is, is depicting us on the foundation of the apostles and the and the uh, tribes of Israel. And then, so then we get to the actual Battle of Armageddon, which uh, is, we saw it start in Revelation 16, where the the battle basically, we, we saw it begin, or the beginning of it, right, with the, 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 the sixth uh, vial, where he poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And then the three spirits come out of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and to get to go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world, to gather them together to that great day, to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathereth them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. That's where we see the first part of this, and uh, the beginning of it. And this, and then we see the, you know, the earthquake that Great Babylon comes in remembrance. And then we have 1718 describing who Great Babylon is, the mystery Babylon. And then now we get to the actual marriage supper, or not the marriage supper. Sorry, the uh, the actual battle of Armageddon. And it's kind of. It's kind of interesting. I always say this because it's really not a battle. It's not much of a battle. It's called the Battle of Armageddon, and it's a and it is you know called a battle in the Bible, but we see that it's just the the a word that Jesus speaks. In verse fifteen here, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and it's so it's it's not really a battle as such. It's just that God speaks a word and wipes out the enemy. And, I would, and this is a good point to talk about here because I've, I've mentioned before that Ezekiel 38 and 39 are matching scriptures with Revelation 19 and uh, the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, seventh vial. Uh, so let's, this is a good place to actually look at that. So I'm going to go ahead and read through this and then we'll go and look at at the other things uh, that I'm that I'm referring to here in Ezekiel. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. I remember because Jesus is 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 treading the wine press of the wrath of God just before this when he touches down. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of the fierceness, fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him 
that sat on the horse and against his army. Now remember, this is this is the gathering of the the armies at the Battle of Armageddon from Revelation 16. And this is the beast and the, all the kings of the earth that he gathers. But but it's just the it's just the word of God, the sword of him that sat on the horse out of his mouth. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them, with which he deceived them had, that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These were both cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So these two men, the Antichrist and the false prophet, are both cast alive into the, into the lake of fire. They're taken and destroyed. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So you can see that, that he brings us with him, right? It shows that he brings the, the saints of God with him, but we're, we're just with him as he just speaks a word and destroys the enemy. And, and we don't do any fighting. There's, nothing, there's no actual battle. Uh, other than Jesus just destroys the enemy. And so when we look at Ezekiel 39, what we just read was all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come gather yourselves, right? It says the same thing in Ezekiel 39 when it's talking about the, the Gog and Magog war. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why Gog and Magog is the same as this battle today. In Ezekiel 39, speak unto every feathered fowl and every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come, Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat, may eat flesh and drink blood. In, in Revelation 19, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men. In Ezekiel 39, 18, that ye may eat the flesh of, mighty, of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. That's that same verbiage. That's one of the reasons that we know that this is the same battle. But then also when we look at the actual battle of Armageddon, when we look at that, the water, and there's a couple of things here that I want to point out. The water in, in Revelation 16, remember the Euphrates River is dried up that the, the, the kings of the east might be prepared. And he gathers them together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now the valley, uh, uh, the, there's a place called Megiddo in Israel. It's north of Jerusalem. And there's a, I, when I visited Israel, I stood up on the top of the, of the mountain there where Solomon actually had his stables and, and it's the start of a, there's a, there's a, a well, a cistern down there and there, a stream that actually fed water to Jerusalem. And, and when you stand up there, you can see this huge swath of land, this great huge valley that and it actually goes all the way into Jerusalem and this is this is the place where God is going to gather the armies that the Antichrist is going to be bringing all the kings of the earth here to set them up to come in to Israel and come into Jerusalem and wipe out the Jews because that's you know this is at the end of God's wrath and they're going to be blaming Israel for all of this and they're going to come in to try to wipe them out. And that's when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives and says, No, you're not going to do this. This is where I put my name. This is my people, and you're not going to do this. And he stops them at that point. But you can see that, that it's the kings of the east. And it's so when we look at where the Euphrates River is, and we look at Iran and, and to the east of Israel, and Iran is almost certainly going to be part of this gathering of armies. And then, but in Ezekiel 38, it says, Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee. Right? So, and a mighty army. And it's, so when we look at that and we see what it means when it's the north parts, it's because Megiddo is north of Jerusalem. So he's gathering all the kings. He dries up the river that the kings of the east might come across. And so the Antichrist is going to be bringing all of the kings of the world, basically, across the, the river and down into the area of Megiddo to set up this great army to wipe out Israel. 
and it's north of Jer Jerusalem, where they're going to be coming down from the north to the south, uh, marching to wipe out Israel and to take over. And it's the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty in Revelation 16 when when the river is dried up. And in Revelation 19, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And then in Ezekiel 38, we see the same thing. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land as shall be in the later days. And I will bring thee against my land. It's talking about that same event, which is this battle of, of Armageddon. Now, in, in Ezekiel, it shows that it's the battle of Gog and Magog. Look at Ezekiel 38. Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And it goes into uh, all the details, and then, you know, and then it says what we just read, that thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land in the later days. And this is that same event where we see the, the events, you remember the fifth seal, six, or the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, seventh vial, uh, Matthew 24 and Ezekiel 38, all have those same things from the chart that I showed. Uh, the fury shall come up in his faith, the, ra the wrath of God. There's going to be a great shaking, the great earthquake. Uh, the mountains will be thrown down. Uh, the walls will fall. I'm going to rain great hailstones. That's all of those things that we see on that chart where it's, it shows that every, all of these events are actually the same thing where it's immediately after the tribulation of the Battle of Armageddon, which is also the Battle of Gog and Magog. We, we see these same events. So what I'm going to show you now is, is why, why a lot of people think that Gog and Magog is something else. And part of it is because of that, where it comes from the north, but the, the kings of the east come across the river. But we see it doesn't, really, it doesn't really mean that it's not the same war. It just means that they gather in Megiddo, and then from the north, they attack Israel. And then, a lot of people say because it says this, this, you know, chief prince of Meshach. They try to say that this means Russia, and it's like, uh, like it sounds like Russian cities and things like that, which it kind of does, but it, I mean, it doesn't really make sense. What does make sense is when we go and let the Bible, it's one of the reasons that it's really important to let the Bible interpret itself because we can just let the Bible interpret itself. In Revelation 20, when we get to where the, uh, it's in the next chapter, I'm going to study it, I'll show you, where the Antichrist, or sorry, not the Antichrist, the devil is actually thrown into uh, the bottomless pit and chained up for a thousand years. And then, after he's released, at the end of the thousand years, he's going to go out and deceive the nations of the world again, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. So when we look at that, the, 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 the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, that's, if you take all four quarters of the earth, that's the whole earth, right? That's the entire earth. And he calls it Gog and Magog. And he's going to gather them together to battle. So this last final thing that Satan's going to do to, to deceive those that can be deceived, that don't love God at the end of that thousand years. And God calls it the Battle of Gog and Magog again. It's the it's this same thing. And what it's showing us here that the, is that the four quarters of the earth are Gog and Magog. That's what it is. And when we look at that that same verbiage in Ezekiel, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. If, if we look at what all this really means, it's the nations of the earth. And what a lot of people miss is this is a part of a map that I have of the timeline of the Bible. And it shows us this, the sons of Noah, one of whom is Japheth. And Japheth had sons named Magog, Tubal and Meshach. If you see that, 
Japheth's, Japheth's sons are Gomar, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. So Magog, Tubal, and Meshach are all sons of Noah. And from them came the, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, the Asians, uh, many, many of the nation, the nationalities and, and uh, races of people that we see today came from Japheth. And then during the, during the rule of the Roman Empire especially, there was a lot of bloodlines mixed. And so really what we're talking about here is, as it says in Revelation 20, the nations of the world. The four quarters of the earth are Gog and Magog. It's all the nations of the world. So when, when he's talking about Gog and Magog, Gog the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, these sons of Japheth, he's talking about the whole world is what it's talking about there. So I wanted to show you that because it's important to understand that I know there's a lot of people that say this is something else. But when we let the Bible interpret itself, we can see that it's that it's just this uh, battle of it's the same battle that we see here in Revelation 19 that we see also in Ezekiel 38 and 39. All of those uh, same things that I just showed you prove that, and we see that it's the it's it's that same last event. When Jesus touches down, and uh, in Revelation, or not, sorry, not Revelation, uh, Zechariah chapter 14. If you read that, that's the same description, uh, the same events, and it shows uh, additional information. Uh, Joel as well. Uh, Joel's kind of a Joel's kind of a hard one to understand because it tends to jump around a little more than. There's a lot of places in the Bible and prophecy where you. you Remember that 2,000 year gap from Daniel 9 that we saw again in Revelation 12? Well, we see the same thing in Joel where uh, the Apostle Peter at the day of Pentecost, he said this was that which was prophesied of, the, of Joel. And it was. It's exactly what happened in Joel. And it's, but it's, when we read Joel, sorry, it's, uh, I believe it's chapter 2. We read Joel it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And Peter says that this, what they were seeing in the day of, on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, was that prophecy. And that's true. But then, you see, and then like two verses later, and then the next verse, it says, I'll pour out my spirit. And then the very next verse after that, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and the in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, and shall be turned, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So it goes from, there's another 2,000 year gap right there, where between what happened on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago and what's going to come on the day of the Lord, which hasn't even happened yet, and so we, and that's a, it's a lot like that in Joel. So Joel's kind of a, you really have to study Joel in great detail and figure out which part it's talking about at which point. And remember, God wrote all of these things in this way, so that those that don't love Him won't understand. And so it's up to us to study and. And love the truth and, and learn and let the Bible interpret itself like we're doing. We're, we're taking other parts of the Bible and putting them together to, to interpret itself and to show us what these things mean. So, so that's the actual battle of Armageddon. And that's, it, like I said, it's really not a battle. It's Jesus just speaking a word and destroying the enemy. Yeah, praise the Lord, and, and the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist are destroyed, and you're going to see in Revelation 20, we'll study that in the next video, where, where the devil is bound and uh, for a thousand years and locked up in the bottomless pit. So we'll study that in the next video. God bless you.